happen. It's a, a sunny day here, even so a bit cold. It was about 10 degrees Celsius in the morning and we woke up to another day in the middle of um, the Corona time, another day and the day how we spend our days is how we spend our lives at the moment. And, um, and it is still uh, full of, uh, of questions. Um, signs look good and better. The smoke signs of the US indicate uh, that perhaps we are turning a corner. Uh, there's talk about opening on Broadway theaters on se September, even so it's not really clear how this will be done. There are no assurances, of course, that the theaters will be full, but uh, small productions have started to work in the park uh, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, controlled environment. So we, we are seeing a, a change. Bars, restaurants are opening uh, here. Meanwhile, um, around the world, um, um, we have seen and we are witnessing catastrophic turns, um, things that are going from bad to the worst and perhaps uh, the darkest uh, spot on planet Earth at the moment. Uh, uh, the heart of the darkness here is, uh, is India. Uh, it is what New York City used to be last year around uh, uh, this time when uh, we were the center of the, of the corona crisis in the world with the most uh, losses of life. But what we are witnessing in India, uh, and now it's also moving to deep to bad, um, is uh, a catastrophic. Already last year, uh, we had a Siegel talk, and uh, it was one of the hardest, if not the hardest, uh, talk for me as a moderator to, to, um, to get through and really wrap my head around. With us today, again, is Abhishek Majumda, a playwright and director, one of the great uh, artists, theater artists in India. Abhishek, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Frank, for inviting me again. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, where are you? What time is it? I'm in Bangalore in my house, and it's 9.30 in the evening right now. 9.30 um, in the evening. Um, uh, normally, today, uh, we also would have the great, great, great puppeteer, puppet designer and director, Anurupa Roy, uh, with us, who joined us also last year. She's a master a grandmaster um, of her craft. And unfortunately, she is suffering uh, a case of Corona so strong. Um, she is not able to talk. Her entire family got Corona. Her father uh, is very, very, very sick. She uh, thought she could join us, um, but she can't. Uh, Abhishek, what do you know about uh, Anurupa? At the moment, she's quite unwell, uh, but she's recovering. Uh, there was, uh, I think, uh, you know, her father was quite unwell three, four days ago. So we were all actually looking for a hospital bed for him because uh, like in most big cities, Delhi is also very badly affected and there aren't enough uh, beds for, for people. Uh, so there was that. But luckily, I think, thankfully, they have received the medical care that they needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody in her family has received the care that they needed. So yeah. she's at home, but she has fever and she's in bed at the moment. So she sent a message to me uh, asking also to convey to everybody that uh, you know, she's sorry she can't make it this time. Uh, and she wishes uh, everybody, she sends her best wishes to everybody who's on this program. Yeah, it is, it is a sad, sad state. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Abhishek for those who do not know. He's a playwright, theater director, and a scenographer. He is the ex-artistic director, and the founder of the Indian Ensemble and the Basha Center for the Performing Arts in Bangalore. Now he works at the Nalanda Art Studio uh, in Bangalore, and he's working uh, around the world, kept up his global reach. He, of course, has been with us at the Siegel Center many years ago, two times, I think, but he's creating new work for the Royal Court Theatre in London, the great Playco company here in New York City with Kate Global, one of the few, but not the only company dedicated to, to work from international um, theatre artists. It's a great work, um, what they put out there, and Abhishek uh, is one of their, their, their collaborators over, uh, over almost a decade now, um, but he also, uh, teaches at NYU University, Abu Dhabi, and, um, and he uh, is uh, primarily working in English, but also in the Hindi, Bangla, and Kannada. His work has been translated into many, many languages, Marathi, 
Gujarati, Spanish, French, Czech, Kashmiri, Bangla, and many, many others. And he holds the title of the Associate Professor of Arts Practice at NYU um, University in Abu Dhabi, and is a visiting fellow of Delhi University. So you live in Bangalore and uh, Abu Dhabi, and how, how close are you to New Delhi? Where are you? Tell us a bit about Bangalore. How is the situation? Bangalore is, uh, is in the south of India, and uh, it's a two hour, two and a half hour flight from New Delhi. Uh, at the moment, Bangalore is the epicenter in India of the corona. You are, it's the epicenter. Yeah. And uh, what has happened is uh, that in Bangalore, uh, till about two weeks back, I think it wasn't this this big a crisis that people saw. Uh, there was clearly, uh, Delhi was much more affected. Bombay was much more affected. We hear uh, this too was, much background noises. I don't know if it's a radio. Just, one second, one second. So I think we have, we have to, um, to reconnect uh, uh, to Abhishek, um, and uh, he will with us in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, right now it is the epicenter. Uh, the numbers have erupted. Uh, there are uh, cases in like ten thousands right now, uh, tens of thousands, and every day there are these many cases. Um, this this is in a state called Karnataka, which is one of the big southern states of India. And uh, we are in a situation where essentially, although Bangalore is the capital, uh, there, I mean, the thing that everybody is telling each other is that we are gasping for oxygen at the moment. That's what's going on. So we are running, me and various other colleagues, are running these volunteer groups, which are trying to map people who are who need beds to the number of beds that are available, uh, to ventilators, to ICU units, to oxygen concentrators, oxygen cylinders, all of that. And it's a massive, massive, massive task. I mean, we are we are awake every night till like five in the morning, and then we do shifts, and somebody's so there is somebody manning it all night, all day. Uh, and every day is uh, is mixed, you know. Every day is like, I mean, today since morning, I think we have had six or seven cases which were positive, by which I mean that we were able to find a bed for them, and there were at least six to seven deaths within our group. We heard about you know cases that we were following, and this is the mm -hmm. fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what we are talking about. Uh, so that's the state. I mean, unfortunately, it's it's an apocalyptic situation. You know, I mean, I have no other words for it. Um, I don't think anybody has ever seen anything like that this, uh, in our country, uh, where people are lined up, you know, even crematoriums and burial grounds. There's a queues of hundreds of people outside to go in and bury their people. And sometimes they're not able to do that. They're not able to cremate or burn because nobody in the family can come out. You know, either they're no more or they're COVID positive, so they're in isolation. So then, you know, other people are doing this work for them. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite bad. It's quite hard uh, in Bangalore. It's in Delhi, in Bombay, in all the big cities, in Calcutta. But at the moment, it seems like Bangalore is the epicenter of this thing. So to understand why theater artists like you are not really thinking how to reopen and writing a new monologue, creating a new video of a past work, you are staying up day and night um, on a hotline where you kind of connect uh, sick people, friends or family, friends or artists who, who need help with hospitals and that. How, how does it work? How, you say we stay up all night. What do you guys do? 
Yeah, so to, uh, what we do is that, you know, we have these, uh, so for example, I'm connected to eight or nine groups, which have people in them. Uh, and it's a three step process. So the first part is that, you know, patients, they don't have to be friends, family, artists, they're essentially anybody will send us, a, there's a format in which they send uh, their request that they have, uh, we have something called the BBMP, which is the Municipal Corporation of Bangalore. There's a centralized system through which people are supposed to get beds. But the number of beds available are far, far less than the number of uh, people who need the beds. I think the ratio is one is to 300 or something like that. You know, at the so moment. 300 beds are needed, one person will get it. Yeah, it's almost that. And I'm talking about like ventilator beds, beds with oxygen and, and uh, uh, ventilators, which will help them do that. Uh, so what happens is the first step is that people write to us, send us their requests saying that this is what we're looking at, looking at after they have logged into the central system. So they get a number once they have logged in. Uh, now, our main job is to look at criticality and try to push these cases, try to find out which hospitals are getting free, which hospitals have two or three beds empty, and try to get these people the information to be able to get to that hospital. Right? Uh, the second part of it is that there is a whole bunch of data on the internet, which you know is updated about uh, which hospital about the hospitals, about who are the oxygen suppliers, who are the vendors, what kind of ambulances, oxygen ambulance, non-oxygen ambulance, and so on and so forth. The data is so large that if the attendant tries to verify each of those calls, uh, it's going to take them a humongous amount of time because all the numbers are engaged, right? Because everybody is calling right now. So what happens is once the number comes to us, our team, which is in each of these units. So now I'm talking about totally maybe 100 people that I'm connected to on various teams across the country. They will make these few calls. With a few hundred, yeah, or with 100 people you are in contact. Yeah, I'm in contact with 100 people who are working. And today I have about 115 cases on my phone. Just tonight. Of like tonight after this call, like before I came onto this call, I went on Facebook, I sent a message to my entire team, all these teams, that I'm going to be on a talk for an hour, hour and a half. So, you know, if you if it's urgent, call me and I'll pick up the phone and take it. But if you message me, I'll miss it. Because it's that much of, you know, uh, it's a race against time, literally. We are, uh, our teams are racing against time. Uh, we have to keep track of what is the oxygen level of each patient, uh, who needs, whose case needs to be, uh, escalated and amplified on social media so that uh, the municipal commissioner can look at it and you know they can say okay this one has to go higher uh, and that's that's the kind of thing that we are having to do uh, a whole bunch of people also verify the numbers because you know there are so many numbers on the internet uh, many of them might have stopped working people might have switched it off they run out of oxygen so it's just to be able to make the to be able to save time for the families, which are trying to reach out, and to be able to escalate cases. Uh, sometimes we are successful, sometimes we are not. I mean, this is unbelievable. So let me repeat, so I understand that right. After you hang up with me, which is already about 10 o'clock in the night, where we are talking now, we will work all night to find hospital yeah. beds, this oxygen machines for yeah. about 100, 10 people who reached out to your group um, yeah. and um, you will go to bed at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning. Um, are you paid for this? Is this part of a, 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 no, no. a hospital work of the state of Bangalore, of the city? How does that work? No, this is completely voluntary. I mean, all the people that I'm talking about, they are working because we need this. We just need this in the city right now. So those of us who are healthy, those of us who are alive, those of us who can afford to do it, uh, many of, I'm sure many people can't afford to do it also, and yet they're doing it, uh, are really doing it because we just need to do it. it there's, no, uh, there's no two ways about it. Uh, also, when I say these 100 cases, they are with me, but there, there are teams working on it. Teams. So right now, for example, yeah, for my job mainly, what I'm doing is uh, I'm trying to see the cases after the first calls have been made by these you know, various teams I'm part of, 
and then to see which one should we escalate, what are some of the other solutions we can look at, which hospitals and which doctors should we connect to. So I'm not actually making the phone calls myself. Uh, I'm sort of overseeing where things can go for you know eight or nine of these groups. And in some cases, you know, which are mostly in rural areas or small, smaller towns, there I'm taking some larger groups. Like, for example, today I was working on an orphanage which needed uh, support. Like there are 17 children there uh, and there was a COVID situation. So what happens then? Who is isolated? How do we find out? RTPs, the tests and all that. So I was working with that orphanage today for the last part of the day. Uh, so most of the times, the ones that I am personally engaged with are the orphanages, the old age homes, the you know, places where there is a, like a bigger group of people. Uh, but our teams are looking at also many, many individual cases on which I'm, I'm monitoring them. Mm -hmm. in, in that group of volunteers, you happen to be working in theater, but the group groups comes from all walks of life, all different professions, or, or are you a theater? All walks of life. Mm -hmm. No, all walks of life, but you know, I think the groups that I'm associated with are majorly populated by theater artists you know, because tell that's us, my circle. Tell us, tell so, us about uh, that group of theater artists. How do you know each other? How do you work together? Uh, why do you think we, we have to do this and not put on a play or anything? I know it's a stupid question, but still, I would like to ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do we know each other? We know each other over the years, you know. Uh, I mean, there are people from uh, from Delhi, Bangalore, Calcutta, Bombay, all places where we've known each other for years. There are new people joining in every day who we don't know, but other people know them. Someone knows someone. Uh, I think a lot of theater people are, uh, a lot of theater people in, are involved. Uh, I And this was true even when we were speaking the last time, you and I, and we were talking about the food relief. A lot of theater people were involved. Um, look, I think there is no there is no question of putting up a play right now. It's there. It's, it's, it's not even thinkable. Till I opened my last play three weeks ago, no, four weeks ago, you know, uh, in Bangalore, we had a premiere and it was already like the, it, like we got through the, just before the door shut. The theater shut in three days from then, you know. And uh, we were really glad that we could premiere it. But then it was right at the end of what was known at that time. Uh, but right now it's death. We are dealing with death, literally death. I mean, we have volunteers dropping out because they can't handle it. It's very difficult for many, many people to handle it. You know, I mean, there are people who have dropped out in two or three days and gone to therapists and sought help uh, because every day we are following up with families, we think that we will be able to get this person to a, uh, just to some life support. Mm -hmm. And you almost develop a relationship, right, with the family. There is a relationship there. Uh, and then the person dies. So the cost of like going to sleep right now, you know, the cost of going to sleep is very high. So for instance, last night, I slept off while my phone was in front. I was sitting. I hadn't slept the night before. And last night I was very, very tired. In between a case, I slept off. Like when we were messaging a, a volunteer from our group, who's also a playwright. His name is Ramnik Singh. He's a very good playwright. He was, he was handling a case at night. And he was talking to me about this case. Uh, in fact, there were two cases running. Both of them are playwrights. That's 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 the kind of world I'm talking about. Both playwrights are handling these cases, uh, which were uh, two patients in the ICU ward. And while discussing, they were coming back to me with scenarios. What should we do? Should we say this or should we say that? Who should we talk to? While doing this, I slept off. You know. And then when I woke up with a nightmare, you know, and I checked my phone, I felt, my God, I don't know what has happened you know, in these three hours that I have slept. Uh, because what if we have missed something? Uh, what if, you know, we don't know. And actually, unfortunately, I have to say it with a very heavy heart that today we lost both those people. We worked all night, but one of them died about three hours ago with a multiple organ failure, and the other person died in the afternoon. So it was quite a devastating thing for the team as such. 
but we managed to solve the case for that orphanage. We were able to sort that out. Nobody was, uh, nobody had a serious uh, problem over there. Uh, but this is our life right now. So the person who died, you know the name, you know the name of the family members. Yeah. You have talked to them several times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in this case, Ramnik, who is the playwright, and Ravindra, who is the other playwright, uh, they spoke to them. I wasn't speaking directly to the family. I was speaking to the sources, which would get them the bed. And I was in touch with them. And I was in touch with the family through them. For example, I was, I was in conversation about whether we should now, if we don't have a ventilator, should we go to a different hospital? Or should we stay in this hospital and try an oxygen solution? I mean, like what? What is the kind of thing? Sometimes, you know, I mean, now in the last three, four days, we have access to doctors 24 hours because of some groups that have been formed. But otherwise, it was shooting in the dark. I mean, the medical system is hugely pressurized. Doctors are working 24 hours. Nurses are working. So many nurses have died. Uh, there, is a, there is a reason why we are not able to set up many home intensive care units, which, which otherwise is a good option because it avoids infection from the hospital because it will be at home. Um, but uh, we are not able to do that because there aren't enough nurses. Uh, I think a substantial number of nurses have died. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, we are all writing. Uh, weirdly, this is a time where a lot of writing is going on. I think a lot of writing is on, on the social media, actually, more than anywhere else. Uh, I think people are writing about what they are seeing. People are writing even connecting political ideas to ground realities. Like today's death, the one in the afternoon that I'm talking about, I wrote about it after that, you know, that this is, this is not a natural death. It, it, a person looks for a bed for three days and three nights and then gets to the hospital. And on getting to the hospital, they are denied admission because the data that had come said it was less severe than what they are now which is obvious because the data is at least one and a half days old and then the patient waits the whole night and then she gets in and then after that she doesn't get a ventilator she gets this oxygen then she gets medicine for one dose and she doesn't get medicine after that i mean this is this is the murder by the state the state has ensured that you know in the in the months from the last time that the lockdown opened to now uh, the government of india set up the ram temple there is a multi-million billion dollar central vista project which is a new parliament the government has still not stopped it they are going ahead with the construction of it it's a multi-billion dollar project uh, they were fighting elections in multiple states, spending crores and crores of rupees. And there was no money invested on, you know, the preparation for the second wave when everybody knew the second wave was coming. The second wave had happened in so many countries before it happened in India anyway. And now we are overwhelmed because we don't have any preparation. And even now, the government is saying things like, you know, uh, look at, you know, they, they have their, the prime minister, the ministers of this party, the BJP, they have their pictures on, you know, vaccination cards and these kind of things. They're so narcissistic about this entire thing uh, with no facilities. I mean, people are just dying left, right and center. Uh, so I think a lot of writing is going on about how this is not a pandemic, that like you can't blame this anymore on, you know, it's a pandemic and it would have come. I think there is a the writing is becoming more political from all walks of life and questioning the government. That, that is, it is just incredibly used the words murder by state. And it is hard to think uh, um, if there would be a trial, you know, theater artists like Milo Rao would stage a trial against the government of India, they would be found guilty of negligence. They would be found guilty um, of not doing the most uh, uh, to, to find practical solutions for what was obviously coming for our viewers. We spoke uh, last, uh, I think, September, I don't remember, uh, October last year. It, it yeah. was pretty heartbreaking. Um, uh, I remember uh, 
uh, Anurupa uh, saying, I looked out of my window, 500,000 people, they help us, the people who live in people's homes and help and clean the weakest of society. They had been pushed out because of quarantine. They were prepared to walk up to a thousand kilometers home with a suitcase and a baby on the arm, a biblical exodus um, and with very little food, only to be returned at the next state border because of the state said, we don't want people who have corona go to our place. They had no place to go. And Arupa said she's taking care or trying to work with a village of artists, theater artists, mostly puppeteers, 10 or 15,000 families of theater artists. And she says, we, at the time, it was not Corona the big, the big problem, but the food. So she said, we are trying to distribute food. There is food there, but as uh, uh, Abhishek pointed out, the organization isn't there. Theater people stepped in. Um, Hugh uh, Abhishek said, you know, I have a list of a thousand people in my cell phone tonight where I could go to deliver the 15 or 20 meals I cooked. And you worked, you have a daughter, you have work at the university, you're a playwright. It was unimaginable, it was already, and it broke, you know, so many people also spoke to me about this. It was not so clear also from the media, but you were saying what is now, what you're experiencing with the less, with oxygen no longer available, people dying, uh, crematoriums not even be able to burn the people, uh, hospitals uh, refusing it, it's apocalyptic, it's a, uh, a scenario, a horror scenario, out of a science fiction film we nobody wanted to see. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it is. It is a horrible scenario. It's apocalyptic. Uh, you know. Also, I think it it really uh, turns on its head this notion of uh, post truth. I don't think we are any. We can make that claim anymore that there is, there is we are in post truth. I think we are in very concrete uh, historic moment with material reasons and repercussions. Uh, and the repercussions are different for different classes of society. Uh, you know, I have to share this with your viewers that you and I, you were just talking about the time when all these hundreds and thousands of migrant workers were walking from one place to another. Very recently, a study was published about the billionaires of India. During the same period, the wealth of the top billionaires of India has gone up by 35%. Incredible. It is the same period, 35% of the top billionaires. They have made so much money during this period. When the pandemic, this time, when the second wave started, just the day before the lockdown, the super wealthy of our country flew out in private jets to London, in private jets, so that they wouldn't be caught in this scenario. And these are the people who support the government. These are the people who fund the government. These are the people who get the contracts from the government. Uh, it is it is a bit like I don't know. It's 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 a bit like what we, uh, you know, like when we thought of uh, when we speak of African nations after independence, often we speak about dictators. You know, Idi Amin and you know that 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 whole uh, range of dictatorial governments who. Uh, had their hands in, in neo-colonization. I think we are in that neo-colonization moment in this country at, at, at this point. Uh, the, and, and the farce of philanthropy. Philanthropy is such a big farce of the super rich that it's not like the wealth tax is, uh, you know, I mean, I was reading Thomas Piketty's book on capitalism and ideology and he, he talks about, he argues for wealth tax and, you know, American, uh, the, the, the most significant rise in American wealth and uh, growth was when the wealth tax was actually at 90 something percent uh, as compared to, you know, more recent times. And he argues against the American model and for the sort of European model of wealth tax. Uh, and 
one has to see this in relationship to India and China and you know various states in Africa like Kenya and Nigeria to see how little is the wealth tax in these countries. So obviously we are not taxing the wealthy, but we are so grateful all the time. We are grateful to everybody. We are grateful for those, you know, a 500 seater non-ventilator oxygen bed facility that they will give up. You know, uh, we are so grateful, but it's our money. It's the work of our people. Mm -hmm. There are there are places in India which have been set up, which have oxygen beds. And you know what the ad says? It says there are 500 beds, but you should come in only if your oxygen level is above 85. Because nobody wants anyone to die there. What use is a center if people should have oxygen level above something? Mm -hmm. uh, this is the nature of philanthropy. So I think it's apocalyptic, but it's also apocalyptic in a very Marxist sense. You know? This would be Marxist view of apocalypse. It wouldn't be the sort of the, the Fukuyama view of apocalypse. Uh, I think that's what we are inside. Yeah, and most probably the super rich, uh, they will have 10 oxygen machines at home in the basement just in case and they might need it. We know that um, very rare ones were brought up also in African countries, you know, or in Arab countries, you know, for, for those families who will not even need it because they live in London, but just in case, and instead of creating yeah. It's yeah. shocking, as you say, um, that India didn't prepare. It looked so good. India was a world model, I think. It has an incredibly high output of vaccination. Um, and production normally, but things didn't go right, it went wrong, and then the preparation was not taken serious. And like everywhere else, the corona crisis magnified any the problems, existing problems. The truth is concrete, that's what you said, that's what Hegel said, uh, Kant said that, and uh, Kant, and, um, and now we see that the reactor, it has a nuclear uh, explosion, the roof is off, as Richard Shackman said, we watch it and we see it. And um, and it's unbelievable what you're talking. Um, I think we at the Cedar Center will think about a way to, to create, a, a, at least show compassion to do a fundraising for you, group, for these artists who get together, sacrifice their nights of sleep to save people within in Bangalore, Delhi, but mostly also in rural villages where there is no help, where there is no hope, and the compassion you show in Steve Artists show, which represents the, the view we have in our profession of the world, it is extraordinary. Let's see what we can do without burdening you. Um, we will maybe do a 24-hour marathon. I don't know yet. We will see. But um, really, Abhishek, uh, we want you to know what you do is incredible. It's heroic. Um, and it makes me weak to think about uh, what you are going through day by day and that since last year when we spoke that it hasn't um, really stopped and now the body count uh, comes up. Uh, we here often we talk about representation on the body on a stage, what it means, gender. What does the representation of bodies in the morgues mean, in the, in the crematoriums, you know, and uh, and um, how do you bring those worlds together? How do you teach at NYU Abu Dhabi? And how do you connect this to your life spending nights uh, finding hospital beds for farmers from rural villages? I don't know how to do that. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, you know, uh, last year before the whole migration crisis happened, before we had our conversation. I was at a moment in my life where I was really thinking that I, I read a lot, but am I reading properly? I had a, like a mini crisis. I was thinking that, you know, I'm reading all, all these things I've been reading for so many years in two or three languages, uh, but I felt that I'm reading all this stuff, all this theory, all this material, all this fiction, but where do I place it? What is my world inside which this will stay? And at that time, this whole crisis had erupted and we were out on the streets, we were in the slums, we were you know, distributing food and so on and so forth. And we really had to come out of our small 
kind of, you know, bourgeois sort of middle class life. And suddenly I thought that this was very selfishly an extraordinary school for me. Suddenly I could see that, you know, Ambedkar and Gandhi and, you know, Nussbaum and, you know, every philosopher I, I have enjoyed reading, their work made, started speaking to me in a very immediate sense because it had to, it had to help me make sense of where I was and what I was doing uh, in a place where people would either get their meal that night or not. So the debates in my mind had to be significant for, uh, for that, me that night's meal for someone. I think now it's become even more immediate because how do we process this? How do we, how do we think about a country? That's the first question. What is, what is this idea that we are a country where we say that, okay, you know, let's say we say, okay, vaccines are going to be available to people in this city, or you have to show your nationality and your card to get a vaccine. So what happens to a poor person if they don't have a car? Uh, so they don't get the vaccine. But if they don't get the vaccine, are the families of the people who have the card safe if someone around us doesn't have a vaccine? So in a way, what I think has happened is it has forced the different worlds to come together. There is this extraordinary line I once read somewhere that... Uh, which said that the, uh, the difference between Voltaire and Rousseau is the unfinished work of the Enlightenment. And uh, it was speaking about what is the role of the philosophy. You know, like, do you, do you then go and sell Swiss watches to the Russian queen or do you en engage in uh, you know, sort of active, active activism and politics? And so what is this? thinker supposed to do. You know, I was also reading, while all this is going on, by the way, I have been reading uh, Coast of Utopia. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Stoppard, Coast of yeah. Utopia. And, you know, there's this extraordinary line I read last night while all this was going on, where uh, Belinsky is asked, you know, he's, Belinsky is told about the success of writers in Paris. And Belinsky said, well, what is this success? You know, in Russia, where I write, uh, stuff gets censored. But much before it comes out, there are students standing outside the bookshop waiting for that pamphlet to come out because it means something so active. So you people think that in Paris you're successful? Is this being a successful writer? Ask Belinsky what is it to be a successful writer in Russia. And if you don't have that, then... And it suddenly makes sense to me. You know, it makes sense to me that even this tension of what is success? Mm -hmm. what, is it, what does it mean to succeed as an idea? Uh, as, as an artist, sorry. Uh, the, the questions in that play, The Ghost of Utopia, where, you know, um, there is Marx and there's Belinsky and they're arguing about the nature of, uh, you, know, you know, what does it mean to be a thinker? Uh, I think we are living inside that moment at the moment, you know. Uh, NYU Abu Dhabi actually just, my classes just got over and it had gotten a bit hard in the last two weeks to teach, I should admit. Uh, because we were hit by this thing. But I have to say that my students and colleagues uh, were so tuned in to, to each other's energy, even inside this Zoom space, that it made life much easier. Like there was this day I, was, I'm, I taught a course this time called Silence. It was dealing with silence and its many dimensions. And I sat and I was about to start my class when on my messages, I got a thing saying that this person has died. Right. And this was two weeks ago. So I saw it and I, I shut my eyes and I sat like this. I thought there's nobody there. I mean, nobody has come in. You know? And I didn't know that the window was open. So after some time, I opened my eyes and I saw all my students. They were sitting quietly because they understood exactly what has happened. And I felt in a way so fortunate to be in the company of young people 
who have a three month course which thinks about silence and architecture, silence and music, you know, silence and poetry and silence as a way of being. And after those two months, when they sit on the other side of Zoom, they can actually create a silence which can hold the space for someone on the other side. Uh, so in a way, this, this is coming together, weirdly. There is not much of a dissonance. Uh, maybe also because of the profession I'm in, like, because I teach and I make theater. Uh, and both of them are so connected in one sense to the world that it gives me tools to survive. I don't think I would have survived 10 deaths a day if I was not reading Post of Utopia at the same time. Do you, do you even think about upcoming work or what your ideas are? I, th I think about it. I think about it, definitely. I mean, I'm, I always think about upcoming work. Uh, because I think it's very much a part of my day-to-day -day life. Like I've been, where we are right now, it is so, so fascist a state that I've been reading a lot about the Frankfurt School, you know, and the tensions of the Frankfurt School and, you know, the, <clears throat> the study done by Eric Fromm about how, you know, mm -hmm. what, what leads to Nazism and what went there. Uh, so I've very recently actually written up a proposal uh, for a bunch of theaters which deals with that. Uh, then I'm directing this Japanese play called Water Station, Otoshoga's Water Station. I'm directing it as a film later this year. Uh, so obviously I have no time to actively engage with that work. I'm not able to sit and write or, you know, do anything of that sort. Uh, but there's something churning. There is something no studio time uh, could give me this uh, intensity uh, that I'm bringing now. I don't think this is, uh, I don't think I'm trading. I don't think I'm trading experience. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm just responding to my time. And I think that's the one thing the theater has taught us very, in a very, uh, you know, concrete way that you have the job as an artist to respond to your time and at the same time be able to have a view which is slightly bigger. Uh, but that doesn't mean, I think when people generally use this word that you know a slightly bigger view, they mean it in the, a pacifist sense. You know, that the moment I say there's a bigger view, we say, okay, there's a reason for pacifism. Uh, but that's not true for the theater. I think theater artists have never been pacifist in its history. Uh, whenever they've had a, whether it's Brecht or Meyerhold or Stanislav, whoever, like in, around the world, in our country, uh, it's never been a pacifist view. Uh, and I was, I was thinking the other day, you know, after some, I was looking at some images of people being burnt and I was reminded of Suzuki's production of Trojan Horse. Trojan I, I saw it in, Trojan Women, sorry, yeah. I saw it in Japan a few years ago. And then he spoke about why the Trojan woman was important for him to you know, speak about his work. Uh, and I was thinking, yeah, you know, sometimes the answers do not lie in your newspaper. Our newspaper right now cannot, can only tell me what's happening. It cannot tell me actually what's happening, mm -hmm. really what's going on. There is what's happening and there's what's happening. I think the real what's happening is maybe in Suzuki's Trojan women. Uh, and that is, you know, I'm sure everybody has their own, you know, uh, hooks to plug into the world. Obviously, my hooks are these, you know, uh, this is what, what my, my breathing life is this. Uh, so I am processing the world through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it's it's hard, you know, to, to, to even to talk about art and theater. It's just so incredible what's happening in your country, your place. Here, people, you know, are 
New York for good reasons also. You know, they are putting up, uh, um, you know, uh, work online with the new monologue or with the I saw a beautiful outdoor performance of Blessed Unrest at Madison Square Park. There was the opening of The Ghost Forest by Maya Lin. Uh, uh, she planted uh, uh, trees in Madison Square Park, um, dead trees, pine trees, to remind us of the ongoing crisis. Um, there, are, there are things that are happening, and, um, and uh, everybody looks that perhaps, you know, we will go back to what it was before, the normal, and we learn some lessons, but hearing what is happening in your place uh, is, um, is, is a shocking reminder. And also how things can turn. Um, it didn't look so bad uh, in between. There's also, if I understand right, it's a new, uh, um, a new virus uh, modification change, the Indian one. It hasn't arrived in the US. What will happen um, if it comes? And will Broadway open and say, but nobody from India is allowed to see it. Will America say, we have to close our borders. We are now everybody is vaccinated, but nobody comes in. 80% of all viewers on Broadway are actually tourists and people from Connecticut and New Jersey. What, what is going to happen? We really do not know, but you uh, uh, now talking to me perhaps, you know, uh, cannot de they give your energy that someone might stay alive. Someone might die as a result of it, you know, that you put an hour away of your time to talk, to talk with us. Um, it is um, just um, an incredible, um, a moment. Uh, would you say in the history of India, it is its darkest hours of the midnight children uh, would uh, talk about this moment? It is the most complicated one since the inception of the state? I think so. I think so. I think for a variety of reasons that is true. And, you know, like during the British rule, there were great atrocities. Uh, if I think of the famine of India, 1943-44, um, there was food grain for the people, but Churchill had moved all this food grain to feed the troops in Europe. And it created a famine which by 1945 had killed 7 million people. 7 million people who had actually grown this food, uh, which is a large number, which is almost as large as the number of people in the Holocaust. Uh, yeah. And we justify, yeah, moment, yes. and we justified that in a way by saying, okay, he was Churchill. He was he was a colonizer. He was their prime minister. He was not our prime minister. So we have independence. But now what? What is it now? Uh, we have never had the moment where systematically for for 10 years, almost 10 years, the country has been pushed this close to war, to communal violence, to Muslims being lynched, lynched, people being lynched and killed. I mean, who, what, what is the history of lynching in India? I mean, I, 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 you know, I was watching this uh, documentary about this song. What is that song? A Strange Fruit. Yeah, about lynching. Yeah, I mean that that kind of historic thing, which ha which used to happen, is happening now in our country, and this is not something which has sustained over the last seventy years of independence. I don't. I've never heard of people getting lynched in this country like that, just because they were carrying a piece of meat and somebody suspected it was something. What the virus has done not only in India, but I think in many such countries, you know, we know this in Turkey, we know this in Hungary, uh, is that it's given dictatorial regimes an opportunity to crush any kind of defense, or any kind of protest, any kind of other voice by saying that, you know, at the moment, we are already in a very big crisis and you cannot be questioning the state. Uh, while the state basically keeps operating as if it was a political party. There is no difference right now between the political party and the state. And I think this is the darkest hour because this time the church is not in England. He's here, he's our own. You know, he's betraying his own people uh, and his, his followers. It's extraordinary, you know. People are saying that there was this huge thing recently about 
spread positive news. Yeah. You should spread positive news. Why are people spreading negative news? And I was writing one day, you know, I wrote, I wrote a small piece saying that during the Nazi, during Nazi Germany, newspapers were filled with positive news. There was so much news about, you know, free, uh, you know, we read in Gunter Grass's work about free ship rights that are being offered by Adolf Hitler to people. And people are thinking that there's a classless society that is being built. Or during Stalin's time, that in Ukraine, you couldn't basically have an obituary column in the newspaper. If a government starts saying that spread positive news, it means you are, you are in a deep, deep crisis. Mm -hmm. Historically, the only reason why a government insists on positive news is because the crisis is so deep and so rotten that any negative news is true. Mm. Otherwise, I would imagine a state, a democratic state would say, tell me what's wrong. Tell me what's wrong. I'm here to fix it. Instead, mm. what the government is busy saying is, tell me what's right. Because I can't fix anything. Yeah. That is really dark for the world's largest democracy. In terms of you know number of people voting, we are the world's largest democracy. And for all the people, I think, who who have shunned different systems of the world, the caliphate system, the Marxist, the communist system by saying, oh, look, you know, this particular country didn't do that well and look at Saudi Arabia and how can that work and look at, uh, you know, Russia and how can this, look at India and question democracy. Is this, is this a viable solution to the world? If you look at India, he's an, we have an elected leader uh, mm -hmm. and we are, we are celebrating death. There are people saying, no, it's, it, it happened because people were not wearing masks. Really? Is that, is that our answer? And people are being put in prison for opening their mouth, for you know, saying things against the state. Uh, everybody's you know, on surveillance. Uh, what is this? Uh, I think this is the, definitely the darkest period in, in Indian, modern Indian history. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I can only imagine, I cannot even imagine what it must feel like. If you know it or you think about it, but to experience it day by day, just being confronted with deaths, with everybody in your family who kept the virus. I know you had it, your family had it, but it might be a mutation, you're not immune, you know, and uh, what yeah, clear consequences of political actions, and now we know it is, makes a difference who's in politics. We all know that democracy is to come. It's never there. It's never perfect. And the, and the idea of uh, a radical equality is that you always work for it. You, you know, anybody who says it is perfect is lying to you. People who say it's black or white, they are lying to you. Uh, um, I think Thomas Ostermeyer, the Berlin director, talked about that. He said there's this kind of socialist or Soviet realism of the happy farmers and uh, the society moving forward, everybody knew it was a lie. And there's capitalist mm -hmm. realism. You know, you buy the coffee and your family is happy. You get this sneaker and you will be as good as Michael Jordan. It's only up to you. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, create an app, do more meditation, do more yoga, and, uh, and everything will be fine and you might be lucky. And this capitalist realism is also a big lie by souls who profit in a way from the system, as you said. Uh, I did not know that billionaires, you know, instead of staying at home, investing money and building up factories to produce oxygen machines, they're going to London on their private planes. It's shocking, it's wrong. It's against everything mankind should stand for. It's against everything theater artists uh, fight for. And we are part uh, on the right side of freedom and democracy. And democracy is a constant struggle. It's slower, you know, people go back and forth. Uh, it never moves as fast as the dictatorial system, but ultimately decisions are better because they get discussed. I, it, it, is, um, it is a stunning to hear. What, what do you think art will come in? Will art come back in the next decade in India? What, do you, what hopes do you have? I know last time you said, Frank, I know my art is important because I get censored. Is that there's TV stuff, millions of people see it, films, nobody cares. My place gets forbidden by the government, so it means they, it must mean something. But what do you think now? What, what do you see the future of performing arts in India? 
I think performing arts in India is a part of day to day life. Uh, by which I don't mean, you know, people going to the theater and buying tickets and watching a play in the evening. That's a very small part of what performing arts in India is. Uh, I'm talking about you know, music and uh, performance, traditional performances, uh, which, which are not necessarily for an audience in that sense. Uh, but also, you know, the, I mean, everybody has acted in something in their neighborhood, in their school, in their, everybody has performed at some point of time or another uh, in, a, in a play, you know, for example, uh, maybe a mythological play, maybe a realistic play, whatever. So, and we are a storytelling country. We are a very old storytelling tradition. Uh, we pass on, we have very little written, even today. One of the challenges of studying Indian history is that uh, a lot of the stuff is not written, you know, it's, uh, it's not archived in the way it should be, uh, but it is oral history and oral tradition. So as long as there is one Indian, whatever that means in the world, I think the notion of performance and storytelling, whatever that means in the Indian subcontinent is going to continue because it's like the color of our skin. You know, it, there, is no, there is no replacing it. Uh, it's not also, you know, like, it, it's an interesting thing that, you know, we are not all the same color of the skin in this country. Similarly, we don't all come from the same storytelling tradition. We are very diverse. I think what what is, that is going to remain. Uh, but what what it is up against is not death. What it is up against is the hegemony of storytelling is forces which want us to tell just one story. That is the contest as far as storytelling is concerned. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, all you see all the Indian epics, they are somewhere uh, at the heart of it is the question of life and death. Uh, what happens, you know, the Mahabharata is so much about, you know, the, it is full of metaphysical questions about life and death. The Ramayana is full of metaphysical questions of life and death. Uh, so, in a way, there is a view of death which exists, I think, in the culture, uh, which also sustains a lot of things. I think it makes people pacifist a lot of the times. A lot of this acceptance of, oh, okay, this is fine, you know, because life is like that and things are unpredictable. There is, there is a basis of that in the stories that we grew up in. Uh, I think many characters in our traditional stories don't have agency. Uh, and when a hero has the agency, it is because of something the gods have given the hero, as opposed to something the hero has built himself or herself you know, as a protagonist. I think these are problems in our storytelling tradition also which we need to challenge. They have helped maintain structures of caste and class for you know thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and we have worshipped, uh, we actually don't worship gods, you know, I think we worship storytelling structures. We have a love, we worship the circular structure. Uh, there is a problem when we worship the circular structure. We believe that things will repeat, that we will go back to where we came from. We believe in the inevitability of destiny. Uh, and um, the reason why the you know Vedic Aryans could take over this entire country uh, was also by you know usurping and appropriating other people's mythologies uh, and then calling everything all of that Hindu when all of that was not all of that was different things. So I think our storytelling tradition will continue, of course, but it needs to ask very fundamental questions of mm -hmm. uh, you know this uh, the structures that we have, the protagonists that we have. I think they have they have led us to this point as much as uh, you know this government has. Mm -hmm. A lot of traditional storytelling has been taken over by television, right wing propaganda. There's one interpretation. I think Anurupa spoke about it last time. How hard she tries to uh, reinterpret the existing myths, perhaps from a different point of view, from the female heroes and, and others. Yeah. And, um, that um, this is, uh, is something that um, needs to change and has to change. It was incredible work in, ahead of you. 
not only in this crisis, but also in, uh, in, in theater, how to reinvent to do something meaningful. I read this piece by Edouard Louis, and um, what's interesting, he talked about shame, the shame of the artist. Shame, one should feel that uh, he called Jean Paul Sartre, who said, What does art mean if you look at a starving child? You look at a face of a starving child in front of you. What does art mean then? You know? And it doesn't mean we have to stop art, it doesn't mean we have to stop doing this, but we have to have an awareness you know, that you know, there is a, a bigger context, as is a global context, and that art also has to reflect uh, um, that, and that artists should be aware. Every artist, the artists in the world should know what you are going through, what you put out there. I could be in your place, by chance you could be here where I am, but we are uh, connected in that way. And, and I think Edouard um, Louis is right. And he says, this is something we have forgotten about and we don't care. And uh, it's elite art form that often, you know, it takes pride that it's not right away approachable, not creates meaning. Everybody can understand that you need so much education thing. And that just says, no, you know, we have to rethink it. And this crisis points it out. So um, there is no end in sight. In, in India, it might take a year or two years, you know, to, to come um, out of this. This is what uh, observers um, are saying. It's so vast, so big a country. And um, in I'm, I'm speechless. I do not know what to do, but I think I would love from the Siegel Center and our New York theater community to do something in a symbolic way, you know, to, to help you guys and show that you are not alone and um, and maybe do little fundraising that towards your organization of theater artists who help to bring oxygen to people. It's what, what more as a metaphor of art can one think about, you know, and what you do to help people survive in this crisis and um, what do you feel? What what would be most needed now? What do uh, how could what, what helps you to get through this? And what what help would be welcome? I think there are various layers to this. You know, the first thing is that we, I very strongly believe that this is not a fiscal problem. This pandemic is not a fiscal problem. Like I said, you know, our country is spending hundreds and millions of dollars and crores of rupees on things that are purely symbolic, which are narcissistic, which are symbols of power, while denying people vaccines, while denying people. Vaccines. So it's not really a fiscal problem. We are faced with a tyrannical system. And one of the things that I would really, you know, again, this is something I wrote about a few weeks ago, is that, you know, what would people do in the world if they were alive? during the Holocaust, what would they do if it was not in the past? They, would they continue to live their lives as if nothing was happening? Would they bother to verify and check what is going on really? Who would they believe? Because there would be different versions of the truth even then. The first and the most important thing, I think, is there needs to be an international pressure on our country, on this government which is moral and ethical. It is not a fiscal problem. It is an ethical crisis. And we, as especially artists community around the world, which often is at the forefront of ethical dilemmas, I think should be very clear in taking this position and examining it for itself. We have so many political prisoners who are academics and writers right now who have not been released, who are there and who are suffering because of this. So this is not, not to believe this, not to believe me on face value, but also not to believe the farce that this is the democracy, that things are all, you know, uh, this is some kind of um, natural crisis which has just become amplified because of our inherent social inequalities and so on. So this is creative. This is, this is a holocaust. This is nothing short of that. And I am not being, uh, you know, I, I'm not being dramatic about this in the wrong way. I think I'm being dramatic about it in the way that it sends the message across. So if there is a genuine need, it is that for people to come together. 
I think that is longer, it has to be more sustained, but people need to have the courage to do it without feeling this thing about, you know, like what is the problem with modern politics is identity, right? We sit there and we don't want to, we don't, a lot of people wouldn't want to step into this because immediately a bunch of Indians will say that, oh, but you are all, you know, you are from America, what do you know? You shouldn't get into this. And this is exactly what happened during the Holocaust before the armies were formed, nobody was saying anything about it because it was somebody else's problem. This is a moral and ethical law in the world right now. And this is, this is going to affect everybody, everybody. In the so first thing is that. The second more, most, more immediate thing, which I think, you know, uh, in, in a way, if you're talking about a fundraiser, I mean, I appreciate that. There, are, there is a lot of efforts running in terms of rural initiatives also which can gain by that, uh, which is fine. But I'm personally always, you know, a bit skeptical about fundraising in this way. Uh, and the reason is that that becomes very simple. The equation there is that the West funds something here, you know, because the currency difference is greater and so on and so forth, uh, which might be helpful. That's not, I'm not saying it's not helpful. But that's a very simple solution. That's that's you know, uh, that's like just I don't know. That's the appetizer. That's not really the meal. Uh, and and this kind of thing can absolve us very easily of a crisis uh, mm -hmm. when it is not that easy, actually. Yeah, I know we are discussing this since yesterday, and I'm, I would love to continue to have the conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And I think the spirit of what you're talk saying, the spirit of what you're saying is infinitely more critical than the fundraising part of it. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the thing that you've been saying since our conversation yesterday, Frank, about solidarity and how do artists come together and what are we asking is really going back to the, to the heart of storytelling. Why do, why do we listen to each other's stories? Why do we empathize with you know, some character from the seventh century? Is that we, we, we feel that we are ready to take those actions which those characters are taking. We understand why they are doing what they are. We are, we are willing to put ourselves in their shoes. Uh, and I think this kind of financial help, although might be welcome in an immediate sense, but it doesn't help anybody get into anybody else's shoes. It creates uh, a very comfortable transaction. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we are in that comfortable a moment. Yeah, no, I really hear you. And it reminds one of, Middle Ages, you know, where the Catholic Church said, just pay for your sins, you know, and they are forgiven. Yeah. And they had very clear uh, amount of money, uh, just custom tailored to your status in society, how much you could give or not. It was so you could, um, you could just uh, pay for it. And it was done. I think uh, there was once an, uh, a project of the Italian uh, um, weekly magazine, and they pretended to be mafia bosses who killed people or did other crimes, corruption. They went to different churches in Italy to see how much would be the punishment, you know? And more yeah. thousands we got, it was a little bit less than Ava Maria's, <laughs> but they all absolved. And they said, you know, God forgives you. And, and perhaps that fundraising part was also in a way, if someone could really help, if Amazon could fly in, one million oxygen machines that would make a difference. But perhaps we do have 24 hour uh, be being at your side. You know, you are up all night in India. Yeah. So maybe do a day of reading uh, of uh, material, let's say, you know, symbolically we stay up yeah. and, uh, and reflect and maybe people read the stories like those lines from Tom Stopper and say what they mean to them. And, uh, and then we show you, you are not alone. Um, it is a, a shocking, and, it, and as you say, this is a systematic failure of a state that pretends to be democratic, but it is not. And India, of course, is in a big competition also with China to see what system will be better and working. So India should look at the truth. As you say, the truth is out there. It is no longer ideological. It's very obvious what went wrong. And they have to be, people should be taken to responsibility. And I think theater artists, have been on the right side on the fight for justice, on the right side of free speech, on the right side of the progress, the social progress, of justice and, um, and of democracy. And I think you are part of that, what you're doing and your friends 
is uh, incredible and it's easy to talk about it fast to listen you have to think that you have done this one day two days one week one month five months six months night after night to go through you know that list of 115 just for this night and that this is what you do as a volunteer it gives a completely different dimension what it means to be an artist in the time of corona and you are such an accomplished artist your plays are shown around the world. If you come to New York and play go shows with, and Kate Lewald finds the money to put them up. By the way, it's shocking how complicated it is in the richest country of the world to put up a play, but the playwright is not from the US or from London, from the UK. We should be open. The majority of people in New York City, they are not white European, they don't look like me, but we don't see them represented. And, um, and there's also a connection to that. Those, those stories don't interest. They are not, of, they are not important. We once had the great uh, Vijay Tendulkar at the Cedar Center, a master, uh, he, he passed away. 20 people came. I was so embarrassed um, um, at the time. And, and, um, and I think, you know, companies like yours and your work contribute to it that we need to need a global awareness. These are global crises. They are no longer also just national crises. And, um, so we feel we have to do something, but maybe, you know, that idea to, you know, just be with you for one day or 24 hours, maybe that would work. And if someone wants to give some money for auction too, but not put that into the center, that could be a good idea. And if anybody is listening, if people have ideas, maybe how to reach out, we have never done that. What social network can help, uh, uh, how to get the word out and just to raise an awareness and perhaps say, you know, the international pressure on the government of India to, to really change things and to take that serious and maybe it's a small um, contribution um, towards that. Abhishek, um, uh, so wh what's happening now when you hang up, you say good night to your daughter, is she still up and your wife, I know you're in your apartment, will you, uh, what, yeah. and then sit at the same table and you pick up and you're on your iPhone or smartphone? No, not, not. Um, my daughter has gone to bed. Yeah. Uh, so I'll see her tomorrow morning. After I keep the phone, actually, I'm going to go down around my apartment for a walk uh, with my phone. So I'm going to make all the calls that I have to make for the last one and a half hours. Uh, what has happened so far, and uh, you know, if there are cases that need to be escalated, or uh, you know, we need to find solutions for some things, and also follow up on some uh, equipment that we are supposed to get, uh, which we can potentially send to the hospitals. Uh, so yeah, those are the things which are next. Yeah, incredible. And you have Tom Stoppard's play next to you. If anybody listens who knows him, let Tom Stoppard know uh, what that means. And perhaps he comes one day to Bangalore and helps to, to, to create this in a, in a community center that play and what it means, what do you mean? It might have, again, uh, Abhishek, really thank you for taking the thank time you. to talk to us. And I know your team missed you, but I think it's also important to reach out. And we are clueless often, it's our own fault. We do not know enough, and we see it on this one way, um, in a small way, of course, you know, to, to be part of a change. But we need to be the change we want to see. We need to be part of it actively. And thank you, thank you, it's always. Yeah, send our love to Anurupa. I hope she will be fine. She will survive this. It was a father and a family. That numbers are devastating. They're coming out of India. They are only the official numbers, as you say, they do not really cover the whole devastation. It is as in New York City did, but the governor suppressed numbers in old age homes. We do not even know the real. Uh, 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 the numbers, what has been there, but people say 90% of what happens doesn't end up in the paper. 90% yeah. what's in the paper doesn't get read. 90% of what's read doesn't get understood. And often 90% of what's written in the paper is a lie, it's not the truth. So um, we're using, we need to find new ways to, to, to communicate and to come to an understanding of the understanding and take place. So thank you very, very much. Tomorrow, I mean, in a, thank you. In a, I don't even know how to make that transition. Tomorrow we're gonna to talk to theater artists from Germany, the curators. The Atta der Welt, theater of the world, the greatest theater festival of the world is to take place in the Ruhrgebiet. Um, and everyone is ready, companies are ready, um, but uh, there is a complete lockdown in Germany. Everything has put on a hold, the 
catalog and the, uh, the program has been published online and in print, but without dates, without starting time, unimaginable. And so the Theater der Welt Festival, as well as the Wurfestspiele, uh, they are on hold. So we're going to talk to the curators what that means. Also, everybody gets paid. I just heard from my colleague Bettina Mills, who works for the German government, who also will take us. They gave $200 million to artists just in that region to support them, to sustain them. It is incredible differences, you know, if we look at the planet Earth closely and, and what is happening. And then on, on Friday, um, we're going to join in with our students here at the Graduate Center for the Booth Award. They give out an award to meaningful, important. Uh, uh, a theater artist and academic and thinker who have made a contribution and they're going to honor Diana Taylor from NYU for her groundbreaking work at her uh, Hemispheric Center Institute and um, so it will be an all day celebration and so this is the rest of, for this week but Abhishek again thank you and I, I feel I don't thank know you, say, I feel uh, in a way also help us uh, do something energizing me to, to help to change the possible raise some awareness of it. So we hope to stay in contact, find a way that we can uh, um, give you also um, the, the secure region where people are, uh, are watching you, are listening, you are on your side. It's all the people are listening and running around you to uh, really, that will help to ensure their survival. Thank you. We really appreciate your support, Frank. Thank you. No, of course. Thank you. And thanks to HowlRound for hosting us. Um, and we play Thea and we learn of the series to make this happen. You viewers, there's so much out there, so many uh, talks now. When we started last March, we were already the only one globally, and that's much more. But I think as we heard today, uh, it is important to listen and to understand and also to support the, the right um, um, the right people. So thank you all, and I hope you will be able to join us again tomorrow. And Abhishek, uh, good night, and I hope um, you will help to solve um, those 115 cases you, you are working on just for tonight. And there will be, I guess, another 100 cases on the next day. Thank you so much and uh, goodbye.